Okay, I'd like to welcome you to the Dean Series on Sustainable Innovation. I think uh, you can tell that I am not the Dean. The Dean is in Washington. Uh, he's giving a talk uh, to the FCC on public media in the digital area, but he's very disappointed that he can't be here for this last in the series of this semester. Uh, the idea is to present innovative projects by Amberg School faculty and uh, center affiliates trying to showcase innovative ideas and programs that were developed right here in-house. So the innovators reflect on lessons that they've learned from their experiences, or if they haven't had time to learn lessons, they'll tell us about what they think they'll find uh, as they move their projects along, and then try to inspire other people to think about how they can innovate in their own work. Uh, we've had a number of very interesting uh, talks this past semester, Exploring Virtual Worlds and Network Culture by Doug Thomas, Popular Music Project by Josh Kuhn, uh, News Entrepreneurship by Vicki Porter, Tom Amalia, and David Westfall. And today we have the Annenberg Innovation Lab with Roberto Soro and John Kaplan. Uh, usually uh, the dean will ask at the end of these meetings what they would have done differently and uh, ask them to reflect on you know, how the choices that they made influenced the, the course of their innovation and how they might change things. And since this particular innovation is just sort of getting off the ground, I don't think that we'll ask them to talk about that. But maybe we'll ask them to think about what it was that, that it, um, started this original vision, how it got started, and what, how it's evolved along the way, and what steps you see going forward into the future. So I would like to introduce our two speakers. And we also have a third speaker that I just learned about, Dimitri Williams. Um, Roberto Soro is a professor in the School of Journalism. He's a veteran print journalist with extensive experience in foreign, domestic, and Washington coverage as a senior staffer for the New York Times and the Washington Post. He's the former director of the Pew Hispanic Center, which is a research organization in Washington, D.C. that he founded in 2001. At the Pew Center, Roberto supervised the production of more than 100 publications chronicling the rapid growth of Latino population. His coverage of Latinos and immigration to the United States has been a continuous theme throughout his career. He's the author of Strangers Among Us, Latino Lives in a Changing America, as well as numerous reports, articles, and other publications on these subjects. John Taplin is a clinical professor of the School of Communication. He specializes in international communication management and digital media entertainment. He was the 1969 tour manager for Bob Dylan and the band. In 1973, he produced Martin Scorsese's first feature film, Mean Streets, which was selected for the Cannes Film Festival. He produced 12 films, which were nominated for Oscar and Golden Globe Awards, and chosen for the Cannes Film Festival seven times. He served at Merrill Lynch as vice president of media mergers and acquisitions. He's the founder and CEO of Entertainer, the pioneer video on demand company for both cable and broadband and internet markets. And he was appointed by Governor Schwarzenegger in December of 2006 to the California Broadband Task Force. So rather than try to describe the Annenberg Innovation Lab to you, I will turn it over to our two presenters. Okay. And then they will introduce you. I guess I knew, um, start out here, and uh, then my partner John will continue. Um, so lessons learned so far, uh, CBK is good, definitely a good way to cater lunch, um, and uh, second, get a bigger room. Um, so that's about what we've learned so far. The rest of it's um, very much up, um, in the, the nascent stages, uh, maybe even prenatal at this point. Um, and what um, I hope we'll be able to do today is um, give you a little bit of an introduction to what we're hoping to create, uh, but more than anything, this is an invitation to all of you uh, to take part in the creation of this, um, this laboratory. It's, it's, uh, it'll exist only, uh, it will flourish only um, if there's very broad participation from uh, throughout the Annenberg School and across USC, and in fact, that's um, its, its fundamental concept is to create a, a venue for um, for experimentation, for innovation, for collaboration, for discussion among uh, faculty, students, staff, others associated with the school and, uh, and their partners elsewhere here at USC. Um, so you're invited. So to what? Um, I, my uh, 
my origins of this, the genesis of it in my mind, uh, comes from uh, my experience in the last two years with the course that I teach in the specialized journalism program in the fall <clears throat> that has a, um, involved a final project um, uh, that's a, a, a development design challenge to produce uh, a new kind of web-based form of, uh, of journalism. And it's a fairly open uh, challenge and it evolves over several weeks and it's highly designed to be highly collaborative where uh, all of the members of the class uh, work together. Uh, several of the students from last fall are in the room here today. Um, they all know uh, that in fact a, a, a really extraordinary number of, number of really good ideas um, emerge from this exercise. I mean, students had, had uh, really intriguing, valuable, new, innovative ideas about how uh, to convey information in a digital space in all kinds of different ways. Um, not predictable, always surprising. Um, it's, it's my gift to myself um, in November and December to watch these things um, develop. Um, but then it reached kind of a frustration point because um, there are good ideas and we didn't really have a means to help them develop them further technically. I didn't have a program where I could say, you know, this is this person can figure out whether this will actually work or not or what it will require. Or you have to, you know, we can have, uh, have to invent something new. Um, nor was there a mechanism to take it to an investor or a corporation or somebody in the public sector, or the government agency or a foundation who might actually be interested in this idea. It just sort of, when the course ended, the, uh, there, were really, I didn't, there was no mechanism to, to uh, take these notions further. Um, it was really about that, that time in, in sort of my own academic schedule this year that Irving uh, Ladosky Berker was here um, as an innovator in residence. Um, for two or three days, and um, uh, a former uh, IBM executive, somebody who, who really was instrumental in helping that company uh, reinvent itself uh, very successfully. Um, and during a series of conversations, some of them private, some of them public, um, he spoke about what he saw as a gap in Annenberg's sort of relationship with stakeholders uh, beyond the university, which is it didn't have uh, a mechanism to take ideas to market um, or to create a feedback loop where uh, interactions with the marketplace would instill a culture of prototyping um, here. Um, and as I was watching um, these students, and I keep looking at them here, developing these ideas, and I was hearing um, uh, Berger's suggestions, um, in this conversation, the idea that the, the words innovation lab popped up at about the, the same time, you know, I looked over at Taplin and he's like, you know, nodding away. <laughs> and, um, and it didn't take long before we were uh, with, uh, with Dean Wilson saying, you know, uh, over the winter break saying, let's, we're going to do this and we're going to do it in a hurry. Um, and, um, and he sort of said, well, yeah, sure. Um, and so he said, we'll do it by the end of the term. We'll have something up and running. Well, we kind of have something, something semi-up and running. This is, a, this is a website that's still very much under development. It's dummy pictures, dummy copy. John will talk about what it does. Um, but the idea of the lab has developed considerably. And I think we've got some idea of what kinds of goals we're pursuing and what kind of mechanisms we, we are going to try to create. Um, there are really two overarching objectives. One is to stimulate innovation um, here at, uh, at Annenberg, and the other um, is to create relationships with external stakeholders that will take the fruits of that innovation to markets and audiences uh, that become sources of both intellectual interchanges, so we can talk to people in the outside world about these ideas and get their feedback on them, um, and not insignificantly the funding, which helps everything in a lot of ways. Um, it's um, the, the kinds of activities um, that we hope will, um, in broad terms, that we're, we're hoping to, to, uh, to generate is a a public showcase for work, including works in progress by faculty, students, and staff uh, from across the school and its associated research and training centers, a place where 
um, where uh, new things coming out of established venues, of which there are many here that are developing innovation, can find another outlet, but also a place where a student working on a project in a class uh, that has some promise can find a, um, a public venue, um, a resource facility um, for experimentation with uh, with new technologies and research on uh, their uses and impact, both developing technology and ideas about technology, um, and uh, being able to apply some funding to, to um, that work. Uh, funding drawn from our sponsors, which we'll talk about later. Uh, funding that can be in the shape both of supporting research efforts, uh, gathering of data, uh, time for academic work, uh, but also technical support for people who are developing um, ideas and may need uh, the time of a, a programmer or um, a, somebody else who can lend technical support and that kind of mentorship and development work um, on an idea. Um, a venue for conversations and collaborations among people at Annenberg and outside of Annenberg who are working on these topics. I mean, it's, as you can see in this room, there are an awful lot of people in an awful lot of places um, that are doing these kinds of things and often very, in a very atomized way. So the question is, can we create some sort of central marketplace where people can come together and have conversations about work that they're doing elsewhere, not to supersede all those other places, uh, or replace them, but, but try to find a place where, where folks can come together. Um, and finally, uh, to serve as a liaison with firms, government agencies, foundations, et cetera, that uh, focuses on the development and transmission of, of innovative ideas and things. So we want to be a place that is a, uh, that where there's an active, ongoing relationship with uh, the larger marketplace, not just in the private sector, uh, but in the public sectors and in, um, in the world of ideas um, for um, innovation that's happening here um, and to create a vehicle to draw uh, financial support from uh, those kind of external stakeholders to support this work. Um, do you want to pick it up from here? Yeah. Okay. Sure. So, I mean, Roberto's given you a good idea of what the mandate was from the dean. And we have begun raising money from corporations. We've had incredibly good response from it already. We have one Fortune 500 corporation, Verizon, already committed, and a couple of others ready to commit, and about 10 others that I'm going to see in the next month or so. So a lot of this is being driven by three factors, one of which is the wireless explosion. I mean, obviously. Once you begin to play with machines like the iPad, you understand that the, the wireless use of video and other things is going to explode. Here we are in 2010, and this is what we're going to look like in terms of the amount of data flowing over wireless in, that, in 2014. The second factor is something everyone in this school knows, which is social networking. As you can see, social networking Time spent on social networks has far surpassed time spent on email. That's a big mark. And third, of course, is what we call cloud computing. The reason this works so well and is so fast is it just has flash memory. It's all sitting in the cloud, everything that it has access to. And so the array of content that will be sitting out there delivered to all sorts of new devices, and not just computing devices, but TVs, will be where the future of communication is going. So we have some near-term projects that we've begun to discuss with some of the corporations that are interested in this. And the first one is something that's been driven by uh, both Geneva Overholzer and, and a lot of work that Roberto has been doing already in specialized journalism is what will the kind of new ways of delivering content for journalism to these kind of things be like? I mean, obviously, I can look at, you know, the Reuters version of, of how I should be, you know, accessing content, and that's great, but it seems to us that there's a lot to be done. It's all very grid-like and not necessarily that interesting. So huge amounts of opportunities there. Interactive television applications, 
Verizon is going to provide us the whole schema and the software development kit for their interactive TV system. And so we'll be able to think about what interactive TV, because as my students know, I believe that everything will be delivered by IP to every device in the future, and that's something we are to do. The third thing is, what is the evolution of this social network as a platform for commerce, entertainment, and journalism? And obviously, Karen North and her students at APOC uh, are, are studying this, but we want to try and support some of those best efforts in ways that can be commercialized. Um, we think that in a few years, you probably will all bring this to school and this will be the one thing you have in your backpack and then maybe the books and the text you read might be filled with video and audio clips and all sorts of other things. So if I'm teaching you the history of jazz in the 1920s, you could pull up that cool clip of Louis Armstrong's first doing West End Blues and that should be integrated into these platforms and so we want to imagine what the ebook would really be like. And then not only because of our interests, obviously you all know that I've made a lot of public TV programs, but the Dean being the Chairman of the Corporation of Public Broadcasting, we're really interested in where public media writ large is going. So, that being said, so we start with things like this. Obviously as a school we're already doing some things. Stroom, as you know, was introduced last week. Uh, Vosmob is an incredibly cool project, which I'll talk a little bit about. Uh, but it seems to us that if you look at, you know, the way journalism is being delivered, it's some pretty cool things that are beginning to happen. This is a demo of, of what Sports Illustrated sees, what Sports Illustrated will look like in the next year. Hello. My name is Terry McDonald. I'm the editor of Sports Illustrated, and here's your new issue. We hope you like the cover. Let's get a look inside. Okay, here are the latest scores and news stories or the contents of the issue. Here's what's in the scorecard section and an interesting take on the Broncos. Maybe okay, so you can see there's some people thinking about how that is, but I think we want to continue to do this. This is another one of our potential partners, LG. This is a plasma screen, only it's flexible. So this is how you maybe read your newspaper in the next two or three years. So, John Seeley Brown, one of our board members, is a board member of LG. We think we will have access to these kind of technologies. Interactive TV. Um, Verizon already puts Facebook on their TV. They call them widgets. They have a weather widget. They have some other widgets, but they're pretty lame. You know, I mean, you could say, who else, who else is watching the show you're watching? But if you imagine... Uh, a TV show and everybody having a little webcam on top of their TV and maybe you're watching a Cleveland Browns football game, you know, out of market pants and there's five little video pieces at the top of your five closest Facebook friends who are all watching at the same time, it's kind of a virtual sports bar idea. It seems to me these things are possible. There's nothing technological that will keep us from doing it. And we ought to be playing around with this because the notion of combination of social networking and television seems to be something important. E-Press. I said to Henry, look, I would love to read Convergence Culture, but I would love to have clips of everything you're referencing while I'm reading the book. And so obviously for Henry and I, there are huge issues of fair use and other things, business plan issues that we're going to have to get into. But who better to do those things than us? We're a relatively neutral broker in this world, and we ought to be able to say to the, both the people who own the clips and the people who are publishing the books, here's a fair way for everybody to get paid. And if something is an academic book that sells 
you know, 5,000 copies, that's one thing. And if it becomes a giant hit and sells 100,000 copies, then the people who own the clips will get paid differently. <clears throat> Next Generation Public Media, we've begun working with Frontline. Um, David Fanning, as you know, came out here and gave a speech, and he has now said to us, okay, we're going to give you a lot of our content that has interactive links in it, and let's see how this could work on TV. They did a show called Digital Nation last year in which over 30% of the programming was uploaded YouTube clips of individual people talking about their digital life. It also featured Henry rather prominently. But in other words, this notion of journalism writ in all sorts of different ways seems to us very important. So the board, as Roberto said, will feature some very prominent innovators. Most importantly, John Seeley Brown, who was the director of Xerox PARC at the time when the Ethernet, the graphic user interface, and the mouse were invented. Seems to me rather important innovations. Um, Irving Ladowski Berger, who ran all of IBM's internet strategy, and Christina Holly, who was at MIT when early Media Lab days and is now the vice president for innovation as well as our deans and directors and Roberto and myself. Um, what will the partners get? So the sponsors will get a customized day-long briefing strategy brainstorming session that will be built for them with our scholars and people who agreed to come into this, our students. They're, we're going to have a yearly Amberg Innovation Lab Longview Conference based on kind of some of the things that I've been doing with the Art of the Long View with major CEOs. The first one will be in the first week of April in 2011. April 8th. What? April 8th. April 8th, 2011. We've already booked it and we've begun to get important speakers and people. And really what we want to think about is the problem for most CEOs is all they get asked about is, what have you done for me in the last quarter, and what are you going to do for the next quarter? And we want to say, what are you thinking about for the next 10 years, not for the next quarter? And so that seems to us to be very important. And needless to say, the people who have been here so far have reacted very strongly and wonderfully to this atmosphere. And after, you know, uh, Ivan Seidenberg, the CEO of Verizon, came, he said, let's give these people a grant. And so I think, you know, we deliver. Um, they will have priority access to a lot of the research that created the lab. Most of it will be done in an open source way, and certain stuff may be patented if the university thinks they're worth patenting, and then obviously the developer, the, whether it's faculty or student that did it, will have their classic share of the patent. Um, so we've created a lab uh, a website, and it's just in beta form right now, but the fact that we did it in about eight weeks, we're pretty proud of. Um, essentially, uh, you, you, I better log in here because so it will help access it. Uh, when you register, you will see when this goes live, you will see that you have to give your USC ID, and you'll, you'll understand in a second why that's useful. Um, one, of the idea, one of the ideas we had is we want to be able to create groups for faculty um, to make things accessible to an individual class. And Okay, so, you know, basically down here on the left is RSS feeds from some of our uh, associated bloggers, uh, faculty who are doing stuff, and, uh, you know, you can click into their sites and go see what, what they're showing and what they're doing that day. Uh, this is Vosmob. Uh, and then up here...
Um, so just a basic description of, of the lab, who's running it. Uh, these are obviously dummy projects at this point, but there will be research. And then the thing that we're most excited about is this collaborate page. So essentially you can set up a new project. Uh, if, you, if you have an existing project, you can create a team here. When you want to edit it here, you come down and you have various things that you can do. You can set up, for instance, design templates. So in my project that I'm interested in, in terms of what is the creation of new kinds of content for this, we'll set up a bunch of design templates so we don't want you to have to know how to program HTML. We want you to be able to just put content in and do what you want with it. Uh, obviously, you can upload any images. You can add a team member if you want. Uh, and, and you'll see why that's important. Anybody can, you know, ask for help in any way. And then in the privacy settings, you can say, uh, this is open to everyone. This is open to nobody, meaning only my team can see it, that I've created for it. Or this is open to a class, my class, COM 306. And in that sense, because you have your ID number and we've crossed that with whether you're in that class or not, it allows us to create a group uh, spontaneously. So uh, we're hoping that the website will be a place where everybody can do. We're obviously open to lots of notions of what to do about it. And so it's just a start. We hope to get it out of beta within the next month or so. And then we'll let everyone know how to get to it. And, and many of the collaboration tools will be up and running fairly uh, robustly. Now, the last thing I want to do is ask my colleague, Dimitri Williams, to come up and talk for a minute. And if someone from tech could switch us over to... Uh, I'll get it. To, oh, you know how to switch it over? OK. <laughs> um, the reason I wanted Dimitri to talk for a second is because one of the cool things we found is there's a huge amount of very cool research going on already. And what we hope with the lab is to try and pull it together in one place where you can get access to it. And this, to me, is one of the coolest projects I've seen in a long time. So, Dimitri. So I'm here is the case study, apparently. <laughs> yes, which is fine. So let me give you a little bit of background. The kind of thing I'm going to show you is not on the initial list of stuff that might happen. Just to give you an idea that stuff that could happen could be just about anything you could think of. Um, as some of you in this room know, my research involves video games and video game players. And one of the interesting uh, innovations in games as well as the rest of our lives over the last 10 years is that they've gotten very big and they've gotten very social. What does that mean for us as researchers? It means you can go in and you can look at them and see them do things in ways you couldn't have seen them do things before. It also means that there is just an absolute metric ton of data suddenly there. And one of the challenges that we have as social scientists is how can we take a look at that data? And what kind of new uses and new kinds of research can we make out of it? Um, one of the things that I quickly ran into when I got my first big batch of data is that my machine, you know, just scoffed at it. You know, it's like, yeah, that's not coming on here. If you ask and you get like terabytes and terabytes of data, we just don't have ways of doing that. So this brings up the sort of second important uh, aspect of my team and what we've done is that it's half communication science and half computer science. The computer scientists really aren't all that particularly interested in the kinds of questions we're answering. They're really interested in how to answer questions. So I say things like, why do people play? What makes their lives better, et cetera? And they say things like, can we build a really cool algorithm and can we show you that? So what I'm going to show you is a natural outgrowth of that kind of combined interdisciplinary work that has been spun out for a commercial purpose. We have been doing research to figure out um, dependent variables in the classic social science sense. What makes people happy? What makes them sad? What makes little Johnny want to punch little Billy? That kind of thing. But from our point of view, um, that's just a dependent variable. And a dependent variable could just as easily be something that is of commercial interest as it is of academic or intellectual interest. Or in many cases, it can be both. So what the product uh, that I'm going to show you here is a prototype of a system that is built for the specific purpose of showing the dependent output of quitting versus staying in a system. Why does this matter? If you own a company and people are giving you a lot of money, 
while they're in their system, it behooves you to keep them there for a long time. So it turns out that games, like many other systems, are subscription-based systems, and the longer you keep somebody in the system, the more money you're making. This is known as churn. If we can predict why some people quit and why other people stay, you can incentivize and change the system in new ways and, and give feedback loops to the people who are creating the content, or in this case, the social um, milieu in which these players are, are interacting. This would make them a lot of money. Um, so here is a uh, prototype of just a simple dashboard interface that was built with the computer scientists I'm working with that basically takes the kind of social science thinking that we've been doing and it, this is a pretty version of a bunch of complicated stuff happening at the back end. At the back end, you have big uh, regression models, logistic regression models, lots of machine learning, social network analysis, all kinds of stuff going on. But this is the kind of thing that a company would look at and not have to look behind the curtain, right? Because they don't really want to know what label propagation <coughs> techniques are. So in this particular case, we are analyzing churn. And so here's a, a simple interface that shows who has quit. And okay, here's some basic reporting functionality. You know, here's the, the pattern of the guys quitting or the Americans quitting or the English speakers quitting or whatever is of interest. Really simple dashboard reporting stuff. We can then show historically who has quit in the past. Take a look at their account, when they started playing this game, when they quit, how long they were there, and how much money was lost as a result of them going. This nicely sortable lets you see opportunity cost thinking for preventing people from leaving a, a subscription-based system and what you might want to think about as resources worth devoting to keeping them in. If you have that kind of actionable business intelligence, you can make a decision about, okay, it's worth X dollars to try to keep this person paying because they're going to stay for five months or two months. Or there actually are people who it behooves you to let them quit. They could be a drag on your system. When you know what they have done in the past, you can then take a look at people who are similar to them and take a look at what people are about to do in the future. This lets companies be much more proactive in thinking about how do we prevent people who are about to quit rather than just reacting to people who have quit, which is what they have done. The state of the art in this industry is to send out a blanket email to say, we really like you, and we hope you stay, and maybe we're having a promotion. There isn't any kind of sophisticated targeting or metrics about even different kinds of players, let alone what we're showing here. So what this shows is, okay, they've been around, this is how long they are, we have a classification system for what kind of action they should take, here's how much money you're going to lose if they go, here's how we found out um, the answer to this, and here's the confidence of our prediction. We're never going to offer anybody 100% um, prediction about what they're going to do. And in fact, most social science um, applications, if we're thinking about this in terms of R squareds, when you get up into the 60s, 70s, and 80s, you're usually pretty darn happy. Um, we're finding um, really, really high numbers working with these machine learning techniques and combining them with social science uh, thinking. We're you know, mixing social network analysis along with decision tree models, doing all kinds of stuff that I hadn't even heard of, honestly, about a year ago. Show me the heat maps. Okay, heat maps. Um, another visualization tool, where did these people who quit go? And in, visual, in the uh, virtual worlds, you tend to get an approximation of actual space. Technically, uh, most of the time in the video game industry, people use this within a shooter game to find out where do people go, where did the sniper sit, what uh, gun did they pick up, where do they run to, to find problem areas and, and spots and maps. This is another way of thinking about it, where you can imagine... Uh, the space here, you can see there are 10,000 activities in this spot, and you can see there's a concentration of red. That is, a lot of people who went there quit. We contrast that with this space down here, 9,000 activities, and it's green. Not a lot of people who went there quit. This is a feedback loop to the content creators to say two things. Number one, something is very good about this area, and whatever kind of mechanics or thinking you put into it, you probably want to do more of that. And number two, whatever you did up here is bad, and you need to stop that because it's driving customers away. Now, that is some pretty cool stuff, but is not, I think, the killer app of this system. The killer app of the system is a combination of social networking techniques that integrate a sense of social influence or contagion in a model to show not just your impact on yourself, but your impact on other people. That is to say, let's say I am a class one asshat in this system. You see me in a network, anybody who comes around me is going to be driven out of the system. There are some people who are inherently negative. Let's say, in contrast, I'm someone who's extremely valuable and I'm in a very central space and I keep everybody staying. That makes me not just valuable for my own worth, but my value extends to how much I keep other people in the system paying to be in the system. That lets you think not just about a person in terms of what's their value for you. Let's say, you know, your customer service representative and a screen pops up and it says, you know, Chris has been here, he's been here for six months, he's paid $15 a month, we think he's great. 
But what if you also know that if Chris quits, 10 other people are going to quit? Boom, answer his question quickly. Treat him really well. <laughs> Let's say he's driving people out. Maybe you don't get right back to him. <laughs> it's just business intelligence to make actionable decisions within your system. So what we literally have been able to do is build network analysis and attach dollar values to people based on their sense of social influence. And you can see here. Oh, well, Dimitri, real quick, could you also know that about your employees in a customer service function, those people in a call center who don't get good responses from customers versus those who do? Sure. And like I tell all my students in every class, when you have Spider-Man powers, you can use them for good or for evil. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. There's a whole other ethical dimension here. Um, this is purely dollar value. Um, but yes, there are lots of applications. And in fact, if you think, obviously, this person here who is 1132 is worth a lot of money in this system, far above and beyond what they are uh, worth if you just looked at them um, singly. The power of this particular approach, patent pending, um, is that it really can be used in any kind of social network system where you can attribute a value and you can find connections between people. So I happen to have been showing you a demo of a project that works for virtual worlds and video games, but the same techniques are working in the cell phone industry and in anything else where people are connected. And the ability to get data and to mine it and harness it and work with computer scientists as well as with traditional social science thinking is turning out to be pretty cool, I think. Great. End of dog and pony. Thank you. Thank you. One, one thing about our case study here, why, why, it's, why it's relevant to the larger exercise, I mean, it illustrates a, a couple of very important things that we're aspiring to, which is um, uh, to support people who are doing important academic research um, that are generating ideas, which is more of what we do here at Annenberg than necessarily gadgets, but doing it in collaborations with other people um, ar around the university. We very much hope um, that we'll find avenues. We've started having conversations with both uh, with the Terabee Cinema, Marshall, um, other schools in terms of joining forces on projects. Um, and it's an, a great example of, of really important research that has fundamental scholarly value, uh, but also has some application in the commercial world. Um, you know, our, our, our idea development strategy is very much kind of a bookend strategy. We, the research agenda is going to be driven uh, by the interests of people here. Um, and at the same time, we're going to be talking to our sponsors to try to understand their needs and, and kind of work to see where these things bridge. But it's not a transactional relationship in that the sponsors aren't dictating the research strategy. Uh, it's very much meant to, uh, to operate at both ends in service of bridge, but, but uh, uh, to be sure that the, the impetus um, is developed out of the intellectual agendas of the people at the school and around the university when they're, when they're working together. And, and we'll try and find people on the outside who may see something of interest uh, while letting people here know what they're thinking about um, and see, hopefully, that'll be a fruitful interview. So, um, questions, comments, suggestions? Andrew? Yeah, I have a quick question. So how would Dimitri's case study, his work, fit in with the Annenberg um, Innovation Lab? Like, how do you see the connection be well, between faculty projects and... We, obviously, if we were up and running and he yeah. had come to us with this idea, that's the kind of thing we would have wanted to fund. I mean, we, we hope to raise a fairly significant amount. Oh, so, so it's funding, so that's one That's a big part of it. And technical I mean, yeah. assistance? So the technical right? assistance. Mm -hmm. um, we're basically building connections with uh, not just programmers, but other labs in this school, and be able to bring the resources needed for any given project. Mm -hmm. So in some ways, we're an incubator um, that will be fairly well-funded and we're an incubator for student projects, for faculty projects, for anything. Will there be a curatorial function in determining who gets access to the resources and how do you imagine that work? Yeah, I, I think obviously we have a board of advisors that we're, we're talking to um, who at, at a certain point there may come a time where we're going to have to say yes, no, but, but it seems to us that at the outset we're we're going to be fairly open to 
to new ideas and you know obviously Roberto and I will try and guide and support yeah. and we there's a, a lot of a lot of smart folks around this building who who when what ideas come forward we can consult with to, um, I mean it's this is, as I said, still very nascent. We have we have um, very large ambitions, which seem more realistic as days pass in terms of the the, the, the size of the you know, the, what the resources behind it are going to be. Uh, but that will determine a lot um, as well. Um, and the other thing that we also have very, you know, uh, we're very optimistic and ambitious about is the, the, the kind of ideas that will come. Uh, but a little bit, um, it's we're, we're all going to have to see what happens. I mean, this is all you know. This thing will develop and uh, get born sometime over the summer, and we'll see by this time next year. We'll I hope we'll have a pretty good idea of, of, of how that all sorts out. But it's um, it's part of the intent here is is not to overly define exactly what the agenda is going to be and, and how it's going to function because it's going to depend a lot on the kind of participation we get and the kind of suggestions we get. But yeah. there's an awful lot of ideas uh, already around here. And, and you know, I was fairly confident, but I think now Roberto's really seeing that when we go in front of corporations mm -hmm. and tell them what we want to do, the response has been remarkably positive. And um, none of them have any ability to set the research agenda. That's they just they buy in to be part of they a consortium, in. and that's yeah. it. Yeah, no, they they don't buy in. They, they give. Buy in. They, they give. give. They give in. Yeah. They give. Very important. Yes. And we're we envision the possibility hello of doing sponsored projects, where you know for exclusive use. I mean, it'd be standard sponsored mm -hmm. project stuff. But but this the basic sponsorship consortium are going to be gifts, um, where and they are literally giving away the money. On a bet that interesting things will happen when they, you know, and in the back. Yeah, um, just curious uh, are the only capital investments coming from the business community, or will they be coming from other sources? We're, we're going to be talking to foundations, we're going to be talking to maybe even government agencies. Can I, can I jump in? Yeah. The, one of the things that I think is really potentially very powerful about this idea is that as a person born and raised in social science, I was not trained to make things. And so the idea of making things has simply not been on my radar. I happen to be lucky enough to collaborate with some people who specialized in making things. If I hadn't, that kind of thing never would have existed. I know the application of it, I know the need for it, I know the usefulness of it, I know the commercial impact of it, but I don't know how to program. And the idea is if you have those thoughts in your head, but you didn't know how to do it, now there are resources and ways to hook you up with people who could work with you and make things for you. That should open up a whole range of thinking to us and removing some constraints which never should have been there. Yeah. I mean, somebody might say along, you know, that's going to have to await the creation of a warp engine, or somebody will say, no, we can do that mm -hmm. pretty simply. Mm -hmm. uh, and here's how. Yeah. Hi. My name is Thomas, I'm the city from San Jose. I'm working on a project to build social capital for individuals for all their, what their development and offline, capturing everything in one place so it becomes their branding, social reputation, and online routine. The project is for social funds, of course, so I wanted to see if I can work with you. Well, I mean, it's too early for us to be entertaining individual projects, and mostly we can... Stay tuned. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. No, I mean, Andrew? we'll be there soon. Yeah, I have a question about um, ownership of ideas and mm -hmm. what, what sorts of things that you talked about with regard to that, because it seems that you know, there's a big question about you know, who owns the ideas, if, if companies are involved, you know, what, what are their views? Well, views? That's, so, yeah, we've, yeah. The basic scheme is, is, is this, very much um, all of it <coughs> dictated by the university's IP policies. Uh, but there's, you know, think of those collaboration pages. You've put, put together either alone or with a team, you're starting an idea. You've got, there's several, uh, there's basically three avenues this could, could go on. Um, it could be public the whole time. I mean, and you, might, you might be working on a grant that requires that everything you do be open source and publicly available, or you may that may just be your preference. Um, 
you can operate in those collaboration pages behind a firewall entirely. Uh, it's non-indexed, non-accessible, where you can develop an idea um, outside of any public eye um, and then decide either to take it public or um, you, you could come to this lab and say, look, you know, I, I need a, uh, I want to put in for help. Uh, whether it would be in, uh, in the form of, uh, of, of hiring a programmer or whatever else it would be. Um, you then, add, in terms of the university, cross a line um, in, from the insubstantial support to material support of an idea. Uh, and under the university's um, IP guidelines, they then start owning um, that, that property once you, and it depends on the, the degree of, you know, if it's not, if it's incidental assistance, like using the website by itself is incidental. Um, once money starts getting transferred, the university policies basically require, if, if it's outside of coursework, it meets a certain number of criteria. Things that are done in courses, the university doesn't own. But, but so, by the way, I, I think it's very important to stress that the individual inventor still keeps right. a big piece oh, of yeah. it. It's just that the Stevens, if anybody doesn't know what Stevens is, is the basically the intellectual property home of the university, has very set rules which run across the whole university. And what your share of it is and what the university's share gets fairly clearly meted out at a certain point, depending on how much support you need from us. Yeah, I mean, and you could... I could, uh, having just recently gone through this with them, yeah. um, it was a real learning process for me. Um, basically, you create an idea while working at the university. The university owns that, but there are ways for you to not only get a share of how well it does, but also to exploit it yourself as it goes on. So, for example, there are a bunch of algorithms that sit behind the stuff that we did. The university steps in and says, okay, this is now a piece of intellectual property that we can create a license for. The inventors are going to get a third share of it. The university gets a third share of it. The home department gets a third share of it. So any royalties that come back on that thing get split that way. Then we create a company, a separate entity. The university licenses that intellectual property to the new company at an exclusive rate and asks for a small percentage of profits from that company. So I can make money as the inventor. I can also make money as the owner of the company that is using that license. The upside of this is it's completely out in the open. I can, you know, as long as I'm working out conflict of interest agreements and being very transparent, I can use the university's facilities and, and help. And in fact, the university has filed the patents for us. You know, that's that's like a fifteen, twenty thousand dollar application per patent and something I wouldn't want to touch anyway. And they're handling all of that. So that's the benefit we get out of it. Yeah, the thing we it's found very was open, very helpful. There is a very clear set of of really good people. Stevens to help us in this intellectual property side. Yeah. And we, we thought it was going to be complicated and it turned out there's so much kind of case law already in place that they know how to do yeah. it. Yeah. They have, for example, open office hours for legal help. Yeah. I, I don't know what to do about such and such, well there's a guy there that I don't have to pay and I can go talk to him. You know, do you need help being set up with venture capital or, you know, or whoever or do you need to hire a CEO? They have a network of people. They're there to help and they are very helpful. Yeah. And just one, one thing that's important to underscore about the arrangement with the, the sponsors here is by giving a gift, they don't own anything. Um, what they, what in, in thanks for their generosity, what we're going to give them is a look. Um, and, uh, but they won't own it. And the looks, you know, are, are something, depending on at what level something is and what the nature of the, the IP is, is, is um, um, it, it, it's obviously something that can be discussed because it looks, it just you know, depends on, uh, somebody could look at this and what they need to know is the algorithm behind it. It would just be enough of a tease to know what's possible. So, um, but, but the, the, the sponsors won't own the, the IP. The university, not surprisingly, owns, basically <laughs> owns everything our lives once you step across a certain boundary. But they're very helpful. Okay, uh, our time is up, so a big hand for our...
thank you all for coming. Yeah, Maybe yeah. the presenters will stick yeah. around if you have some Definitely additional MIT questions. Style thing in the West Coast. It's kind yeah. of exciting to see. Thank you so much. That was great. Yes. Yeah, definitely. Yeah.